Okay, about 20 years ago, uh, I moved up to Oregon from New Mexico, southern New Mexico, Chihuahuan Desert, where I knew a little bit of, about creosote, mesquite, cacti, and I knew absolutely nothing about Douglas fir, western hemlock, rain, and fog. So during those uh, rainy and foggy days, when I was trying to understand my new job as a district wildlife biologist, I spent a lot of time reading Management of Wildlife and Fish Habitats and Forests of Western Oregon and Washington. And uh, I learned about forest succession. You've, you saw, you heard a lot about that today. And just when I uh, thought I understood about early seral and managed forests, this came out in 1991, Wildlife and Vegetation of Unmanaged Douglas Fir Forests. And when I looked at this book and I read it, I realized my job had just gotten more complicated. Focus on this document was unmanaged forests, but really, I think we all realize that all the forests are, are in one way or the other managed forests. So here we see a schematic of several stages for a managed forest and an unmanaged forest with early seral being on the left and late seral being on the right. As managers, we tend to, uh, it seems like, focus on one extreme or the other. I think that's probably because it's easy to see the extremes when you're in late successional growth forest, you know, you know you're there. And then when you're in a clear cut or an early seral stage, you know you're there. It's all the stuff in between that gets kind of hard to, hard to quantify. But there are some major differences between the two extremes. On the left, uh, early seral forests are created quickly. In fact, if you look at our management history between 1950 and 1990, I think we've shown adequately that we can create early seral forests fairly rapidly across the landscape. Whereas on the right side of the spectrum, it takes lifetimes to develop the old growth forest that we work in. So early seral forests, I'm going to define that for this talk as no or low live conifer cover. And that's because hardwood is kind of a component of early seral forests. The two, extre the two different types of early seral forests um, that I learned about early in my career were the type with no snags and the type with lots of snags. And I'm going to talk about the type on the bottom where you have lots of snags. All right, so the forest is on fire. After the smoke clears, what do you do? This uh, happens more frequently than I anticipated in my career. Well, we have lots of choices. But before we make the choices, I've found that it helps to put things in context. So let's try to do that with these next series of slides. Um, this series of maps right here show changes between 1914 to 1996 in the mature and old growth forest patterns in Western Oregon. And um, I think there's no mystery. When you look at this map right here, there's really not a lot of differences between 1914 and 1940. You see the effects of the Tillamook fire right here. But really, there's not a whole lot of differences between those two time periods. There's a major difference between 1940 and 1996, and thus, this is why we've been focusing on late successional forests and spotted owls and things of that nature. But in all of that heated debate about that extreme side of forest succession, I think we forgot about another component of the forest because that's just one component of the forest. This is another component of the forest. And looking at those same maps, you can kind of get a feel for the patterns of early seral forests with lots of snags. They were definitely part of the landscape, and in some cases, very large parts of the landscape. Between about 1950 and 1990, this part of the forested landscape virtually disappeared because of salvage, fire suppression, and none of the reasons. As of 2002, this is what the picture looks like. 
Okay, setting the context. Now I'm going to use some of the latest and greatest data that we have available to us to help set the context for your situation. I'm going to talk a little bit about gradient nearest neighbor. I'm going to show you some maps. These are maps that are developed here in Oregon State University at the Forest Science Lab. Basically take satellite imagery and convert it into some sort of attribute using plot data and models. Give a shout out to the Lemma team. These maps wouldn't be available if it wasn't for the hard work of Janet Oman, and Heather Roberts and Matt Gregory. All right, Western Oregon, in terms of conifer cover. 1996, here's a snapshot from low to high. I'm gonna jump ahead a decade, 2006. And I'm gonna kinda go back and forth between those two slides. And you can kind of see some nuanced changes. But it's easier to take one, subtract it from the other, to bring out the contrast. And that's what this slide does. So these red areas represent where conifer cover decreased in that 10-year period, which roughly coincides with the first decade of the Northwest Forest Plan. And the green areas show where conifer cover has increased in that decade. The yellow areas it's pretty much stayed the same. Now you can actually quantify the change. And when you do that for Western Oregon, about half of the forested landscape has more or less remained the same in terms of conifer cover. About a quarter of it has gone from some sort of high conifer cover to low conifer cover. And then about a third of it has grown conifer. Overall, there's a net ingrowth, about 5% at the scale of Western Oregon. Most of the decrease has occurred on private lands, a little over half, and you can kind of see the pie chart. On the, uh, state takes up just a little slice of the pie. And here's kind of pictures or examples of those several changes. Again, on the left, you have on the coast range of Oregon, a big pocket of decrease in conifer cover. It's clear cuts on industrial forest land. Over here, on the right in the Cascade province, you see large patches, and those are basically caused by fire, and they have lots of snags, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about. Okay, so those wildland fires, where have they occurred in the first, in, the, in this 10 year time period? And if you bring in the federal land, you can see most of that early seral occurs on federal land, whereas most of the other early seral occurs on non-federal. This is where I work, or since 1995. And I moved from here to here, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Since then, since, 19, uh, since 2006, we've had a few more large fires. Now, this is a pet peeve of mine because I hear over and over again that the Western Cascades of Oregon doesn't burn. And <laughs> my experience has proven that that might be the case in certain parts of the Western Cascades, but certainly not down in the southern part of the Western Cascades where I, where I work. So let's redraw the line. I think it's time to redraw the line. This is something I'm working on. If you look at the actual topography, the climate data, and the fire history data, I think the line that, that splits Western Oregon into fire prone and not so fire prone is more like this. It, it extends up from the Klamath province a fair ways into the Western Cascades province. But that doesn't mean that the other side doesn't burn because it occasionally does, and as you can see from this 1914 forest map. Thing is, on, on the west side, along the coast range, those fires are infrequent. We haven't had any big fires since at least 1968 on that side. And when they do occur, they're usually big. Whereas on the fire prone portion, fairly frequent, but small to moderate sized patches. So this map shows you the fires, large fires greater than 1,000 acres since 1970. 
And again, if that's not enough, enough map validation for you, you can actually go back and bring in some maps for forest tree species distribution. This is sugar pine distribution map that was created in 1971. And without, without fire, sugar pine wouldn't exist. So I think this is just another validation of this type of delineation of Western Oregon. Or you can look at wildlife species in the case of blackback woodpecker, which is a strong associate with stand replacement fires. Have you ever wondered why if woodpecker feathers are black? <laughs> I finally figured that one out halfway through my career. Okay, now we're going to zoom in Umpqua National Forest. Again, Conifer for cover 1996. Jump ahead a decade. You can kind of see those changes a little bit better. We got some big openings happening. Those are happening from fire. But between those big openings, there's a lot of green coming in. It's getting darker. So you look at the difference this way, and you can see kind of this uh, checkerboard pattern of clear cutting on private land, but on the federal side, not so much of that. Most of the big patches are from fires. And one thing I'd like to know is fires aren't total stand replacement. There's different levels of fire intensity, and they don't uh, always remove 100% of the counter for cover. Okay, I'm going back in time now. All this is I'm trying to set the context to fi you know, figure out what to do after fire. 1987, I was still in New Mexico. We had a bunch of fires that year. Um, these are the perimeters. And most of those fires were salvaged. The only place that wasn't salvaged, to my knowledge, was this little piece along the Wild and Scenic River, that little piece of red. 1991. Now, this to me is a watershed year for early Searle with lots of snags. This is the Warner Creek fire. And in my, in my opinion, this year denotes the first year where this type of forest started recovering in western Oregon. That fire, not because of management decisions to not salvage it, it wasn't salvaged, and there's you know, reasons why. Okay, 1996. Now I was on the forest, and I remember these fires. This is a spring fire. We didn't salvage it, and really, part of the analysis we did for this was we realized that this was a natural piece of, of the forest. It was mostly in a wilderness area, so we couldn't salvage it anyway. And the rest of it was in LSR, late successional reserves. But after a bunch of debate, it ended up not being salvaged. So 1996 really marks the year where we started getting this type of forest restoration on the Umpqua. 2002, big fire year, record-breaking fire year. 89,000 acres burned on the Umpqua. And some of it overburned that 1987 fire, and this is what that looks like. So this is the unsalvaged little piece of forest that you saw in that previous map. So these snags are 16 year, years old, and they're taken a year after the fire burnt through there. Okay, I'm going to zoom into one fire that we did salvage on the Umpqua, called the Apple Fire. And um, it's along the North Umpqua River. Those red areas represent the stand replacement patches or early cereal with lots of snags. We chose to salvage this portion of the fire. We chose not to go in here. This is all LSR in the roadless area. And um, an area that we did salvage, we still maintained a lot of unsalvaged. Um, area. And in the salvage here, we had various retentions of, debt, of, of trees. This is what it looks like today. One of the things we did was a snag inventory. So before we, we got into the salvage, we went out and we did a landscape type inventory to figure out what the snag distribution was at on the landscape. And these dark areas represent where we have high densities of dead trees. All right, so wildlife response. This is um, something that we did to kind of gauge the response of, of wildlife species after the fire 
and before the salvage. So again, the yellow units represent the portions of the fire that we salvaged. This is a breeding bird survey transect that we established in 2003. I'm going to quickly go through 10 slides. The first five show the, the major increasing species, and the next five show the major de declining species. This red area right here shows the period of salvage. Now, this hasn't really been analyzed. This is more just um, bird count data. Um, and we're comparing it to 10-year pre-fire average. So the biggest uh, response and our increase we got was from Lazuli bunting. White crowned sparrow seemed like that early serum. Now whether that little decline is caused by the salvage, I don't know. It looks kind of suspicious though. House wren, they seem to like fire with lots of snags. All sided flycatcher. Again, you see a little dip there during the period where they were salvaging. But after the salvage, it's continuing to in increase. Now we have eight years, I believe, of data. We're, we're going to be continuing this, this um, monitoring for the next few years to see how it goes. Mountain quail, this is, uh, they like the uh, fire also. And uh, I don't know if that's related to the salvage, but maybe they just have a cyclic response to fire. I don't know. Okay, the, the ones that are going down, Hermit Warbler came in as number one as far as a decliner. Hermit Rush, I mean Hermit Thrush, Varied Thrush, almost went away. Golden Crown Kinglet, and Swainson's Thrush. Overall, the bird species richness increased slowly for the first few years after the fire, and now it's starting to decline. Now, I can't say that's related to the salvage, I don't know what's causing that. Maybe that's just a natural pattern. In summary, we all know that wildfire destroys green forests. Are you guys awake out there? <laughs> Actually, this is a, a sign I took a picture of on, on the Umqua, and I hope we know that this is not true. Wildfire changes wildlife habitat in my opinion anyway. What's odd about this sign, this is the only sign I found on the force that didn't have at least a dozen bullet holes in it. <laughs> so yeah, wildfire changes wildlife habitat. And in some cases there's winners and then there's losers. If you're a red tree vole and you eat Douglas fir needles and you make your nests in Douglas fir old growth, then that fire probably was not a good thing for you. Same, could be, you know, same story for, for land snails, you like moist microclimates. When I was doing my field recon for that salvage, I, I found very few live snails, and even fewer slugs. Now, if you look hard in this picture, you'll see a deer in the middle. Oh, it's, it's easy to see on the big screen. Um, they're winners, they you know, they're gonna, there's gonna be a good response from, from big game species to this fire. Woodpeckers, a lot of woodpecker activity. So yeah, the fire burns up, things look black, it looks pretty devastated. We, some people tend to think it's catastrophic, but really the vegetation starts to come back the year after the smoke clears. The wildflowers start to bloom. And you can find natural reforestation going on in places where the microclimate's um, good, shadows of you know, some of the remnant logs and snags. This is ponderosa pine, which needs fire to, to exist, so the fire was definitely good for this species. And if you know where to look, you can find the survivors of the fire. If you look real hard at this picture, you'll see two Encetina salamanders. One right there, and one right there. Here's another one right there. Actually, I was finding lots of salamanders, even in the most burnt landscape. That was interesting. There's a close-up. You know, a lot of little creepy crawlies. You'd find those, they survived, and they're gonna, they're gonna probably benefit off the flush of nutrients and the primary productivity that's gonna happen now because of all the sunlight that's reaching the ground. 
and they're going to carry on to the next generation. And I know there's some fish biologists in the, in the audience here, so I put these next two slides in for the fish bios. So, you know, fire, you get a lot of, a lot of wood in the streams. And I remember the year of the 2002 fires hearing and reading in the newspaper about how muddy the streams are going to be. Uh, yet the following year in Panther Creek, which was the heart of the stand replacement fire of Apple Fire, totally surrounded by dead trees, I took this picture of some spawning steelhead, and the water looked pretty clear to me. So in conclusion, out of the black, the green will come, and you know there's various wildlife responses to fire, but it's a natural process. Um, it benefits some species, it doesn't benefit other species. We have to be careful as managers in how we manage for it because, as I mentioned earlier, if we wanted to, we could create a lot of early seral fairly quickly. And even if we don't want to, fire is going to do that for us. It has, and it has done that in, in at least a third of Western Oregon. Um, but we can't do that without putting it into context of the entire forested landscape in terms of the old growth that remains. And you just got to balance it all. And that's all I got. <laughs>